All right, in honor of Valentine's Day, I'm going to read a little section of this book called You Are the One You've Been Waiting For, Bringing Courageous Love to Intimate Relationships by Richard Schwartz. All right, so the magical kitchen metaphor, page 49. Before we explore the development and power of exiles, I want to offer a way to understand this material. Don Miguel Ruiz uses the metaphor of the magical kitchen to describe intimate relationships. I will embellish his metaphor to illustrate what happens with our parts. Imagine that you inherited from your parents a magical kitchen in your home from which you can obtain any kind and quantity of food. Because your parents fed you unconditionally, you learn to do the same with your many children. They are happy because they love your food. Your food is so nourishing and satisfying that they never overeat or crave candy or other kinds of junk food. You never use food to punish or motivate them. Consequently, they trust that they are worthy of being well fed just because they are your children. They don't fight because each one of them knows there's plenty of food for everyone. You also give freely to friends, neighbors, and those in need of food just for the pleasure of sharing. You know that you don't need to hoard because your food supply never runs out. Then, one day a man knocks on your door and offers your children a steady supply of pizza and candy if they'll take care of him emotionally. Because you and your kids are so full and you can see that he doesn't take care of his own kids, your response is, no thank you, we have plenty of food of our own. On another day, a different man knocks. He is like you in that he's had many children who he feeds generously and who are happy and satisfied. He's attracted to the cuisine of your magical kitchen, but he doesn't need it because he likes to cook and has plenty of food of his own. His children love playing with yours and would like to live in your house. But because they know that he will care for them no matter what happens with you, they trust him to decide where to live. You invite him to share your home, and you love how much the two of you enjoy each other's cooking. Both sets of children relish the mixed cuisine that now comes from your kitchen. Now, imagine that you live in a different household. You are very poor and have little food for your children. Because they're starving, the youngest and weakest of your kids cry all the time and beg you to find someone to feed them. Their desperation drives you crazy and you lock them in the basement so that they aren't always in your hair and you're not always reminded of their suffering. That's the way your parents taught you to handle problem children. As hard as you try to ignore the sobs of those young ones, however, you can still hear them through the floorboards. The urgency of their need is like a constant gnawing in the back of your mind. Some of your older children lose trust in your ability to take care of the family. They take on adult-like responsibilities, prodding you to work harder, trying to contain or calm the ones in the basement, and searching for food. Because these older ones aren't equipped to handle this level of responsibility, they become rigid and controlling. They are constantly critical of your work habits and performance and they expand enormous amounts of energy trying to keep the basement children at bay. As the guy with the pizza and candy heads towards your door, the basement children smell the food before he arrives. They go insane with joy at the prospect of being fed and possibly released from their exile. They idolize the candy man and are willing to do anything to please him. You and the older kids are hungry, exhausted, and impressed by how happy the candy man makes the basement children feel. The possibility is very appealing of no longer having to deal with them and instead letting them attach to someone else. Consequently, despite some misgivings about the guy's demands and the poor quality of his food, you and the older children agree to satisfy his emotional needs in return for steady meals. He turns out to be abusive at times, but your younger kids fear starving and being returned to the basement. Also, while he's increasingly stingy with the pizza and candy, the younger kids are addicted to it. Every time you bring up the topic of throwing him out, they override you. Now, imagine that the food in the story is really love and the children are the different parts of you. 
If you identify with the first parent who has the magical kitchen, you don't need to read the rest of this book. That's because when you love and accept your parts unconditionally, simply because they are you, they won't be attracted by the false promises of certain other people. And when you find the right partner, your parts won't be so dependent, demanding, protective, or easily hurt that they create constant drama or make you tolerate abuse. Instead, they'll each love your partner in their different ways, enriching your experience of intimacy, secure in the knowledge that if they are hurt by him, you are there for them and will deal with them. If you're like most of the people in this culture, however, you learn from parents and peers to exile certain parts of you. Therefore, the basement of your psyche is filled with love-starved, vulnerable inner children. Because they get so little from you, they will be obsessed with finding someone they imagine can rescue them and, out of their desperation, will blind you to that person's faults. So they're likely to make you pick Mr. Wrong and then, because they are so needy and vulnerable, will either make you stay with that person for too long, will overreact to perceived hurts from him, or will try to control how close or distant he gets to you or to others. So where can you find the equivalent of a magical kitchen, a boundless fountain of love from which your parts can draw? It's in the last place you would ever think to look, yourself. But your parts have been convinced by messages from our culture and by the way you've treated them in the past that their only hope for finding the love they crave is in the outside world. Well-fed parts. This notion is not entirely a myth. Your parts can get a great deal from another person, but that's only possible if they already have a loving relationship with you. In this book, you will learn how to become the primary caretaker of your parts so that your partner can be their secondary caretaker. Many books on improving relationships contain some version of the truism that you can't really love another person until you love yourself. In most of those books, the idea of loving yourself is held up as an abstract ideal to strive for, or else you're given affirmations to repeat as a way to counter all your negative self-talk. In this book, you will find concrete ways to tap into the magical kitchen of yourself, which will allow you to love even your carping self-critics and your basement of children. And you will find that, just as is true of well-fed children in the outside world, your inner characters will transform. They'll become lighter and happier when you feed rather than starve them. When that's the case, they will enhance rather than encumber your intimate relationships. Your partner will appreciate this arrangement because she won't feel the weight of your emotional dependence or the sting of your rage when she is unintentionally neglectful. Your parts will look first to you rather than to her for their sustenance and for comfort when they are hurt. With this arrangement, they can stay calm and not panic when she distances not fear being hurt when she gets close and allow her to be who she is rather than make her into the image of the person they have been dreaming of. When she cries, shows fear, or otherwise acts like one of your vulnerable parts, you can lovingly comfort her because you know how to do that with those parts of you. When she's angry, you don't have to get defensive because you don't have a nasty inner critic that is agreeing with and amplifying her criticism of you. When she is shy, you don't begin to judge her since you are accepting of the shy part of you. In other words, because you can love all kinds of parts of you, you can love her even when she's acting like those parts. It's all connected. How you relate internally directly transcends translates into how you relate externally and vice versa. Intimacy is often defined as the ability to reveal all aspects of oneself to another and feel accepted. Because you aren't ashamed or afraid of your vulnerable parts, you can expose them to your partner and experience the joy of being fully known and witnessed by another. When your partner is similarly vulnerable, you can be lovingly present with her, but not feel as though you have to fix anything. You can have a relationship in which all parts are truly welcome. Even when one of your partner distances or is angry, your sensitive parts don't panic because they trust that whatever happens with her, they still have your love. When all that is the case, you will be able to bask in the radiance of your partner's love because you won't fear losing it or being engulfed by it. 
When, you're, when life hurts or scares your parts, they have two sources of solace, yourself and your partner. When your partner acts like one of your parents and unhealed wounds make you feel horrible, you are able to speak for rather than from those wounded parts because they trust you to represent them well. Consequently, you communicate your hurt with clarity and respect without the blaming or pouting that comically, commonly typifies such interactions. In turn, your partner is able to act in a compassionate manner, which helps your parts revise their beliefs about intimate relationships and unload the pain they carry from the past. In this way, your partner can help you heal without carrying the heavy load of being your healer. All right, so I've been reading from You Are the One You've Been Waiting For, Bringing Courageous Love to Intimate Relationships by Richard Schwartz. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I like this guy. I think he has a lot of good stuff to say. And, um, you know, checking out some kind of introductory materials to internal family systems theory can help if, if this, you know, sounds a little confusing. But uh, mostly it seems pretty straightforward. And um, I don't know if anyone's ever going to watch this, but I really enjoyed saying it out loud. <laughs> okay. Happy Valentine's Day.